even if you're not a yoga practitioner, it's not like a class, um, you're in or you're out. I don't like what I call yoga apartheid. Think that somehow we're superior to anybody else because we do yoga and they don't. We think green and they don't. Or they're not in our logi logi yoga lineage, right? My guru is better than your guru. All that kind of low-level bhakti. It's still love, but it's misguided in my understanding. By the way, welcome to another two men. Always great to have men. I like to acknowledge you. Thanks for being here. And I just saw Tom. Everybody see Tom before? You know, Tom met his wife at the yoga circle. Okay, so I go back way back with, with, with Tom. Really great to have him here. And also, there's a very small amount of yoga teachers who are studio owners. So those of us who've been in the business for many years have bonded just because you know the future is female, and almost all the practitioners at entry level for sure are women. Welcome. And uh, a lot of the studio owners, of course, are women. And the goddess has supported me since 1970 when I first got into this, so far be it for me not to acknowledge that. All right, there's the man. Good to see you. Thanks a lot for coming. <clears throat> so only one chorus, because part of the aging experience for me, and I can only, for those of you who don't know me, this is my plagiarized line from Ram Das, one of my teachers. Everything I say is all about me, but there's nothing personal in it. So I'm not really interested in you learning my autobiography or the things about the timeline of my life that I'm sharing. I'm interested in you listening to it like a story. Right? I'm a keeper of the old traditions, so a lot of the transmission isn't left brain. And I have the easiest job in the world because even if your conscious mind thinks that what I'm saying is bullshit or you're defending against it, your subconscious mind is listening anyway. That's the part that I'm really talking to, so I can just put the pedal to the metal and know that it's getting in there in some way, even if you think you're resisting it consciously. It makes it so easy for me. But part of the idea is in the aging process, and remember, <clears throat> there's no guarantee, death doesn't give you a guarantee that you won't die at a younger age. So I started this when I was 22, right after I read Plato's dialogue about Socrates drinking the hemlock and being absolutely equanimous as his body is going numb and he's describing to his his students and uh, apprentices, what's going on. They're freaking out, and he's maintaining composure. I'm saying, like, oh, now that is something I got to find out more about. How is it possible to even drink the poison, to refuse to take the exile and admit you were wrong, and be there, welcome, as a rabble rouser, as a yoga provocateur for the younger generations, and get them in dialogue, ask them questions, and get them to respond to you. As you know, Socrates was looking for the wise person his whole life, couldn't find anybody in the Socratic dialogues. Really interesting, if you've never read the dialogues, you're not too old to look at them now. But the key that you get from that is, at a certain age of your life, you might say, more than half of my life is over. And since you don't know when that is, I would suggest you start reflecting on that right now, because that's part of your aging process. Maybe you already know people younger than yourself who've already died, number one much, much younger than yourself that's already died. In fact, I'm sure you probably even know teenagers and children who've already died. So am I making my point about death is no respecter of age? So get open to this. Get quick on this. Read Aldous Huxley's Island. You don't need minor birds flying around going, attention, attention, attention. You've got to light this fire yourself. And if studying with a teacher is what gets the unlit candle to be a lit candle, fine, find yourself a teacher. But remember, the guru isn't physical. And you don't need to know your guru if you want to believe in incarnations while you're alive. The guru knows who's you, who, who you are, and the level of the guru being consciousness that's going to dispel your darkness, it's already working in your life. So then you get to another stage of your life where you say, maybe more than half my life is over. Right? Maybe three quarters of your life is over. But certainly, it's probably wise and not impractical to think there's more of my life behind me than there is in front of me. And living the good life, whatever that means to you, by the fruits you shall know them, the karma that you're experiencing in your life is a combination of triumph and victory. But if you've taken the yoga path your whole life, you'll probably find out that there's more victory than defeats, more better people in your life than people who you wish you didn't have to deal with in your life. Almost everybody who practices yoga for any length of time will say, I'm better off now that yoga is my life than I was before, even if my life was good before. Welcome, glad you're here.
So if you've planted seeds all the way along, then whatever age you're at, 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, right? but you're experiencing the harvest of what you've created. And that's really beautiful. And you've still probably planted seeds that they haven't gestated yet. They may still come to fruition while you're alive. Or maybe you'll be one of those people where this is the metaphor, you don't really have to do this. You plant trees for Israel or for the forest in the United States. Things you know you'll never see. But that's not the reason why you did it. Because that's who we are, homo aestheticus. We try to beautify our environment internally and externally. I'll only do one chorus so that we don't eat into the Dharma rant part and you realize this is like an entertainment thing. By the way, what's your latest bad dad joke? What did the hat say to the hat rack? You stay here, I'll go on ahead. <laughs> what is an ex-hippie's wife called? Think, think something in the United States. Mississippi. Once upon a time there was a tavern Where we used to drink a glass or two Remember how we laughed away the hour And thinking of the great things that we do Help me Those were the days, my friend We thought they'd never end We'd sing and dance forever and a day We live the life we choose We fight and never lose those were the days, oh yes, those were the days. Hello, la 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 Those were the days, oh yes, those were the days. La 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 Still can hit the E note. So I don't want to take too much time. I don't know where to begin a talk like this because there's so many different angles that uh, I want to come at this talk from. Because when I speak to any groups and they're always mixed age, it's like a Whitman sampler of evolution. You know, or like the Forrest Gump box of chocolates. I never know what I'm going to get. Some people might be teachers of yoga who've had decades of experience. Other people might be teachers on the way 15, 20 years. Other people might be relatively new, just trying to overcome the imposter syndrome. Who am I to teach this to people when I don't even know what it really is? Right? Teacher trainees, people just dabbling, people who have interest in the topic but are not necessarily yoga practitioners. So let me get this clear so those of you who are going to get a handle on where I'm coming from uh, might make this a little easier. But I'll tell a story first, because it is Friday, and traditionally I always tell a story on Friday to honor my grandmother who wrote the, lit the Shabbos candles. And what I'm really saying to those of you who are not Jewish and don't get this is honor your ethnicity. If the United States is going to make it as a mongrel nation, and the world is still looking to us, not because we're exporting free market democracy or capitalism or anything, that's all bullshit. They're looking to us to see, can we have diversity? and see the unity and the diversity. If we can do it, the whole planet can do it. And remember, although the age of Aquarius is not for another 150 years, those of us, certainly like myself, who are the harbingers of what is to come, the visionaries of the planetary unity that's way ahead of where we are right now historically, and that we don't have the political will to do this, even though the vision is already there, the resources are there, but we haven't pulled together yet as a planet. So those of us who see this already and have been giving this message for 50 years since I came of age, remember the song, this is the dawning of the age. The dawning, it doesn't happen like that. It's not going to be like 150 years from now when the procession of the equinoxes moves from Pisces to Aquarius that all of a sudden the light switch turns on and everybody gets it. It's a slow movement in the lurch of evolutionary history forward. Now remember, that's happening at the same time as I'm not going to go into a large political diatribe against the United States, because remember, we're free here more than other people to speak out against what's going on. 
But you all know we live in a, in a, sy a system where it's the best government that money can buy. All right? Do you understand without me going into it's the corruption that exists? Welcome, glad to see you. So if you just follow the simple history of the United States, and this is the dark part, so just get clear about this. People came over here, the Dutch, the most free thinkers in the 1600s, while everybody else was at war in Europe. They pulled all the outlaws, all the scientists, all the creative people here. They first bought Manhattan Island. That spirit is from New York, and I'm from Brooklyn, no hype, that's where it is. And then the expansion came and manifest destiny. If you look at the history of our country, unfortunately, we genocided every single indigenous culture, raped their people, tortured them, kicked them out of their language and their religious, religious tradition, forced them to go into our schools, sent them to reservations, broke every single treaty, and not only us, the Spanish did it down south and in Mexico, the French and the Russians did it in the northwest till we covered from east to west, and then we hit the highlight, what? The Civil War. So the same thing that was already rife in the colonies, it split completely almost 100 years later because they didn't want to give up the fact that their economic base was a slave trade. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Not north against south, economic interests against different economic interests. Jim Crow is still alive today. Forget that, we move on. The captains of industry took over. Now all of a sudden from the mid 18, late 1800s onwards, the United States became an imperial power. It moved away from being a col colonized by an imperial power to become the imperial power. And I don't want to go over the rest of history. If you want to know the scaling history of the United States, Noam Chomsky. Go look at Noam Chomsky's work from MIT. He's not only a linguist, he's the most severe critic of the policies of the United States and very well academically prepared in this. So if you want alternative media, not Fox, not MSNBC, not um, public radio, same story, just different spin. Look at the dark side. Keep on going post-World War II. Oh my God, were we the cops of the world after that? And then keep on going and then it starts getting dark. We didn't win the Korean War. We didn't win the Vietnam War. Now the middle class kids, the baby boomers, my generation, we get the education that our parents from the Depression and the grandparents who came over on the boat, as my grandma did, by herself when she was five years old. They were tough people. All right, and made their life and passed it on for the next generation and next generation. Remember, when the original Im immigrants came over, the, Jew the Italians were hated, the Irish were hated, the Scandinavians were hated, the Germans were hated, all hate, and then the next wave comes in, they assimilate into society, that's where we are now, except it's not just the European immigrants who are coming over. We've supposedly opened our doors to the, to the poor, the masses huddled, yearning to be free, right? And there's backlash against that, isn't there? Keep on going, behind the scenes. I love Barack Obama, he was so erudite. Watch Jerry Seinfeld, the uh, comedy, getting coffee in cars with Barack Obama, fantastic. Love him, unbelievably way he spoke. But you know what, seven wars were going on simultaneously. You can't be a president of the United States and not realize there's dirt going on in the background. We say we foster freedom. You know how many guns we sell to Saudi Arabia and other, other places that don't have our vested interest in heart. Then we play Israel against the rest of the Middle East. Horrible. Don't want to go there. Understand? That's who we are. All of that's bubbling in the United States. That's the historical movement that's moved us to this point, while at the same time are all the things that began in my generation that's still going on now, which we said, hell no, we won't go. It's an unjust war. Drinking a cup of green tea, I stopped the war. I took LSD. The only way that God could come to the cannibalistic consumer capitalist culture that I was born into in a material chemical and it burst through. I saw, I understood. You can say, oh, you were drug induced. Life is chemical. Do yoga, stand on your head, do some breath of fire, change your diet. You don't think it's gonna change the neurotransmitters in your brain? Your academic research is very poor. And besides, I was an apologist for the psychedelic movement. So if you want me to footnote you to death on plant medicine and the search for the sacred, not drugs that you take as a naughty boy, a naughty girl to have kicks behind mommy and daddy's back, the real search for the sacred, which in a secularized culture like ours, I also came through the understanding that there was a lot about organized religion, which it didn't fit. Just a little example, and I know this is patriarchal, so goddesses forgive me on this, but that's where the language comes from. And remember that we're still suffering under defining these things with biblical grammar, with language and thoughts that are over 2,000, if not 4,000 years old. Move on. It doesn't reflect what's going on in the spirituality of our generation. 
Yes, there was heavy things that happened in their generation, but there's something heavy happening in our generation. We need to learn to reflect the way we talk about that and articulate it, because that's what the logos, or the power that we all have, like in the Bible, it says, let there be. When you understand your power to let loose stuff in the world, what are you going to let be? Because the logos speaks being into being. What form are you going to give it? Watch your mouth. The, the mouth is the quill of the heart. So all these forces are meeting because when I was coming of age, the zeitgeist in my time had unbelievable hope, had unbelievable vision because we had the whole world's understanding of history up to that point. Now think about what's happened since 1970 in terms of the amount of information that's available on the, on the, on the web. And even though there's a lot of weird stuff on the web, un, uh, undeniable, but at the same time, you can find out anything you want in a tutorial or just Wikipedia yourself to death. You don't need the Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. You got it right there in your cell phone. These two forces are clashing. The dark forces that show the division in our country, the disparity in our country between simple common sense, simple human courtesy, simple human decency in acting to each other. And yet at the same time, it's bumping up against resistance to that. And for those of us who are lost in that bubble, you understand? It's a noggin scratcher. How can that possibly be? Right? And I don't want to get into talking about how do you speak to people who are anti-vaxxers or anti-science or anti-reason, whatever. But remember, we all make choices based on our emotions and not on our thinking. So they must be hurt human beings to take that stance. And it hurts the heart to see that when people retreat and you can't connect to basic compassion. Nonetheless, so I'm in both worlds. I still see the vision, I live it, I embody it as much as I possibly can. I have for, since 1970. Not that I'm waving my flag, but I'm saying, you've all carried beautiful feelings yourself your whole life. And if you don't see it reflected in the larger world, who's going to give you credit? You have to think of yourself like the Dalai Lama says, if it weren't for those monks lost in the Himalayas, unknown that nobody knows, 24-7 just chanting, Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Padme Hom, to send out grace waves to prevent chaos from totally taking over, Right? We all be, we'd all be up Schitt's Creek. You've done your part, even though you may not think you have. And you're going to continue to do it, and I hope after today you're going to do it with more gusto. And come out of the closet. And admit that you're living for spirit. That's not a psychotic ideation. And that's not what happens when you, live, when you practice yoga. Yes, you practice yoga for what I call humanistic values. You know, slow the aging process, get more flexible, calm your mind. Learn what it is to study a subject you love. Learn how to do selfless service for the benefit of other people. Let your life be a living love story. Begin the day with love, continue the day with love, end the day with love. Care about as many people as you can. Be as generous as you can to as many people as you can for as long as you can. Even if you're afflicted, I'm not going to go into my afflictions, but let me know. I'm a walking wounded. Probably every one of you is too. And if you don't know that if you came to one of my yoga classes, right away I'd see where the limitation is in your anatomy that you probably already know about or try to avoid. But yoga isn't about escaping from stuff. It teaches you both how to engage in life and also how to disengage in life when that's appropriate, which you're supposed to do every day in your practice. You pull back a little bit, get out of the social net, and then you ultimately are preparing yourself for from in the body to not body. And yoga counsels you. It's called abhinavesha, clinging to life in the fear of this. This ain't easy for anybody. Ain't nobody want to do it. Especially if you're in love with life. And yet, you don't got a choice about that. It's inevitable. It's going to happen sometime. And uh, for those of you who've already buried grandparents, great-grandparents, or parents, God forbid, your kids, right? You know what I'm saying. You probably have seen and been to many wakes or funerals already. So you know what I'm talking the MS. The truth is they're saying about it. I'm not someone who's selling you a bill of goods about what you can, yoga can or can't do. So you've got to keep the spirit alive amidst the fact that we're still in that moment of history where the arc of justice is so long. It takes such a long time for these things to filter through societies and change the cultural kaleidoscope. Does everybody understand what I mean by the cultural kaleidoscope? Somebody say no, otherwise I can't pontificate. Yeah. Thank you. Like a kaleidoscope, remember the thing that you put to your eye and you change it, you turn it a little bit, oh, and it changes the whole thing, and you change it back again. So 
Each one of us is constantly changing perspectives based on the idea that your family is like a circus. It's insane what you have to go through with the different people in your family. That's just your family. Then your family is probably in the context of some kind of cultural thing or ethnic thing. How does that skew the view of the family and each individual's relationship to that? You've got to deal with that. Then you get outside of the family because rarely are two people in the same family born under the same household, roof. So then you find the family of affiliation. It could be the gang, or the sports team, or the military, or the yoga group, right? or the sangha, whatever you want to call it. And it's skewed in its way, because it has its view that's different than everybody else's view, and so on. And then the larger picture, when your tribe, and hopefully you're beyond malignant tribalism, right? we're not yet across the planet, but we're aiming to ensure right, domestic felicity, go beyond, right? we're aiming for that. Can you recognize the beauty in other people's way? as crazy as they are, because every country is a mafia, every country has its shadow side, but I've spent my life recognizing the beauty in other cultures because you will not fight with other people when you share recipes. You will not fight when you share music and dance and song and storytelling and comedy. And ask them about their history. Every person has a pride about where they came from, even if it's a dark history. There's still something to feel about their people being in exile. You know, the Jews are not the only culture that like have exile and diaspora. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. When you recognize that in another person, it connects you. That's communitas right away. You don't have to be connected to them because they believe the same religious tradition as you or they eat vegan or something like that. Those are those low level connections. The broad human connections, what's trans subjective. It's true for everybody. Just like in yoga we teach, gravity affects you, right? Who's going to say gravity doesn't affect them? They'd have to really make a strong case to get me to even contemplate that. So what are the things that unite us all, the common ground? So those are the things that culturally we all share all over the planet. Respect other people's by going into yours. Find out more about your ethnicity. And then you'll immediately recognize, oh, that's the same way we tell stories. That's the same way we celebrate the holidays, whatever. And there's the unity, there's the bond. That's what yoga is really teaching you, the vision of unity. And I know it might not be as simple as a one-liner, because one-liners are like free therapy, right, Colleen? Yeah, one-liners are like free therapy, and uh, one of my degrees in psychology, but I have to, like to give this stuff away. Um, if you're going to, hi, glad you're here. If you don't meet God in the next person, no sense in looking any further. How about that for a challenge? Because that's one of the things that aging stops. The older you get, there is no next. There is no thing to look further to. And I'm not saying that from a down position. When you've drink life, drunk it to the dregs, right? There's a certain satisfaction right now. I'm not saying that I wouldn't like to go to another concert, eat another great meal, make love to my wife one more time, see my girls one more time, whatever. But I don't need to. I don't have to, even though I'm clinging to life on some level. None of those things do it. Nothing leads to anything else. This is it. Wake up right now with whoever you're with, whatever you're doing. That's the fire. You have to learn to sustain that. And hopefully, yoga is one of the things that lights that sparkle again. It both lights it if you didn't know that you had it. It teaches you how to store it. It teaches you how to distribute it. It teaches you how to get it back when you drop it or feel like I've lost it. It's an amazing thing. And I never say that I'm only talking about yoga from India. I'm talking about yoga as a generic term for what do you do to experience the universal abstract living spirit. Which of course we can't even describe what it is. I'm just using words like a springboard to go into something that we really don't know. Because since it's totally unknowable in its, its ultimate form, which is what's called the via negativa, or if you follow the mystical traditions in the, in the church, what they call the cataphatic way of expressing, through negation, through substitution. You can't say what it is, you can only say what's not. So this is like in yoga, neti neti. It's not this, it's not that. And if you could negate everything so nothing's left, that's what it would be. But you can't conceptualize it. You can't say it in a word. Like in the Jewish tradition, the Ein Sof, they only show you what the face of the king is, in the side profile, because that side is hidden from view. You never get it. So anything, that's why the Swamis stay silent when they ask, what, what, is, what is God? And then 
you're too dumb to get it. So, so it will tell me in words what it is. Neti neti, it's not this, it's not that. I'm sorry, way over my head. Can you say it in a positive way? Tatvamasi, thou art that. Plumb the deepest essence of who you are and that's what you'll find. It's called Atmanas Brahman, the light within you. It's not even your own. Your ego would like to appropriate it for itself. But, you know, the sunlight that's coming through the door over here is not the same as the sunlight that you're going to perceive in the front of the studio. But if you trace the light back to its source, they all get annihilated in the sun. That's the mystical understanding. There's a part of us that is that. But you can't say it in words. So any words you use is a choice between mistakes or misunderstandings. And so that's why you use images. Images, because the images become this way. You'll see it that way. It's like a chameleon, depending on which side you're looking at it. You know, it looks red from here, it looks blue from here, it looks yellow from here. You know, and the Swami says, yeah, that's because it's a chameleon, depending on where you're looking, that's how it is. Or as Ramakrishna says, God gives different kinds of devotional services according to the powers of digestion of the devotees. Just like a mother gives milk to the baby, then boiled fish to the next one, then sautéed veggies with fish to the next one, then pickled fish for the next one, according to the powers of digestion. So if you stopped your inquiry into what living spirit is when you were seven years old because you realized the adults didn't want to admit there was a pink elephant in the room and it was making you crazy because you knew there was and they were saying there wasn't. And so you realize they're not accountable anymore. They're not reliable anymore. They can't be my spiritual guides because they lied to me and they're in collusion with the man. And even though I love them because they're my parents, something just died in me. And you stopped your inquiry at that level. That was a big mistake, not only just academically. So if this is a chance for you to reclaim and redeem and free up those beautiful spiritual potentials that you have so they can come back out like the Lami, uh, Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness, so we can treat each other better. And there is a huge fund of human decency all over the world, not just in the yoga community, which there is, for example, all over the world, but in so many different ways that people are trying to make a difference. And I hope that you all are doing that now and find deeper and better ways to continue to share what only you can. So getting back to where I'm coming from. I'm a cancer, so I move sideways. Astrologically speaking, I don't mean like I literally have cancer. So you confront the shadow aspect of our culture and what its negative history is. But there's a positive history to it as well the hope that we all have, the vision that we all have of possibilities. We can't have equal outcome, but we can have equal opportunity. So we want everybody, like I would say, the good king and the good queen. You have all the resources available to you. It's your job to make sure that everybody in the kingdom or queendom has potable water and access to medicine and education and nobody starves. And there's justice, both severe when necessary and mostly merciful when you can so that everybody gets an opportunity to share and you give money for the culture. You want poets and you want song people and dancing people and artists to add to the luster of the community. And even when you get so old that you can't dance on the floor, I still can throw a good dance and be delighted in everybody enjoying themselves out on the floor. So you continue to live, live with a certain largesse and munificence. And that is a model for other people to aspire to. So here's the two parts. You have to deal with the darkness, like Joseph Campbell says, joyful participation in the sorrows of the world. You don't pretend and deny that there isn't suffering and some heinous things, heinous things going on, even as we're here in this lovely environment with time on our hands to do nothing but to discuss this stuff, instead of most of us who already had experiences where like we've been in the room with our dying mother and grandmother with a catheter and, and changing them and wiping them or just that's going on right now. People all over the world and people in the refugee camps and the people in oppressive uh, situations in Afghanistan and all, everywhere and in our country especially. Right? Just talked to a friend today, happens to be somebody from Highland Park, has the money to put his mother in a good nursing home. Right? But do you know how many people, because they don't have the economics, they have to go into a kind of schlock place where they're not getting the care and, and the rate of dysfunction and, and death that happens in places like that. Can I, somebody say, shake your head so you know that I'm talking the MS here? Yeah, exactly. So that's happening simultaneously. Doesn't that break your heart? It doesn't seem like there's anything we can do about it because the scale is so great. This is where analysis leads to paralysis. There's so much that needs to be done. I don't know where to begin, so I just get frozen. Pick a note and perfect it. Find the thing that speaks to your heart, right? Take a small step. Take a small step. I'll talk about that in a moment when we deal with depression. Take a small step and keep on going. 
So you have to confront the shadow both in yourself psychologically and the greater shadow in the cultural milieu and even the global shadow that we live in. And that has to be balanced by the celebratory aspect, what I call the via positiva, right? Keep, keep the laughter breaking through. Keep the good humor. Somebody is still playing on deck when the Titanic is going down. Someone is still in the middle of Sarajevo, Sarajevo while they're bombing and doing Mozart's concerto. Some of us still have to keep the banner high, bring out the good vibe, lift up everybody to the extent that you can. As an elder, and not only just an elder, but I would say I'm a ritual elder in my community, you never leave the people without a vision of hope. And that means you have to lead by example. That means you have to create ceremony where everybody participates and everybody gets a chance to add to the vibe that we're all creating together. And then you're filled with the ex exaltation of spirit, fulfillment now, as well as the vision in the future. Just like yoga gives you benefits to the first time you practice it, not only just freeing the muscles, that first good relaxation, right, when you hit the shavasana. Ah, oh, I have to have this more, this is great. But it's also a cruel system. Keep on doing it, you're gonna get benefits in the future. So you balance the shadow work with the celebratory work. I invite everybody else to play. So again, I just say the same metaphors again and again in different ways. I invite you out to play, but some people can't come out and play because they're so hurt. They're so wounded. They're so threatened now by what happened in the past, whether they were the perpetrators and they can't get over the fact that they did that to somebody else, they can't forgive themselves, or they were perpetrated on. And they're so wounded by the pedophilia or, 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 or the, the incest or the rape or the, or the whatever, the harassment. It's unbelievable what people have to live with. But they never got the coaching to be able to break through it, if you can break through it, because there's almost always a scar, right? It's like drawing with a pencil. You can erase it, but there's still a little line there. Is it possible to take that particular weaving off the loom of your life with all its twists and turns and put it to some good, good use? I'm a wounded healer. It's one of the archetypal motifs I live with. Not only just viscerally what happened to my hurting my back when I was 15 years old, I can't remember what it's like to live in a body that doesn't have some kind of irritability or pain. And then I got an autoimmune disease seven years ago that made, moved me from an iron man to a frail elderly. And I had to fight back um, till I could be as independent as I was before. And then I broke my hip five months ago, and now I took another initiation into the limping king. I've told stories my whole life about how they initially ritually wound the king and queen so that they never forget with every step they take along. Oh, well, remember the people who are the low people in the totem pole in your kingdom, because that's every day of their life and not just the limp. It's the lack of food, the lack of water, the lack of education, the lack of justice. Oh, doesn't that hurt you? Yeah because I'm one with the bones of the land. And if something is not kosher in Denmark, I can't sleep at night. And then you get on fire for wanting to be good for everybody. But that's the Messiah complex. I can't, right? I've told my students from day one, the one thing I won't be able to do is I can't prevent you from dying. I can't prevent myself from dying. So let's use our understanding of that to do what we can while we're here. I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here, right? I no longer run from the rain. Hoping, oh, I don't want to get wet, because when I'm dead, I won't be able to run from the rain. I embrace all the experiences, every one of the senses. Keep looking, listening, touching, tasting, smelling. That's the sensate way of experiencing spirit. Don't put it into some formless thing that's disembodied. Life is the great gift. Let's not go into an esoteric dialogue about whether or not there's anything post-mortem. Right? Life is the great gift. Utilize it while you have it. So, for the rest of this lecture, now we're at 3.35. Did you open your heart, my friends? The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic tradition, told his disciples, don't write down my teachings. And then one day when he was walking in his house, he saw a demon going by with a book under his arm. He says, what's that book you got? He says, oh, this book? It's your teachings. So then he knew that one of his disciples was writing down his teachings. He called all the people together. Who's writing down the teachings against my commandment? One little yeshiva bracha raises his hand. Let me see. This is what happens when you don't listen with the ears of heaven. Then the Yetzirah, the evil impulses, uses, uses you for its own intentions, and your ears hear what I did not intend to say. I can't make you 
shift to the place where you hear everything I'm saying and it touches your heart. I can only tell you that if you don't also listen with your heart, a lot of this won't get to you. Do you all know that you belong to the tribe of the Sacred Heart? Yeah, don't know that? Well, also, there's a clan within the tribe of the Sacred Heart. It's called the Scar Clan. Is there anybody here who can raise their hand and tell me you don't have a scar in your life? Whether physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, existentially? No hands? Oh! Oh! Well, you know what that means. You know, in the old days, you used to have the, all those buttons on. Remember? Like, you know, black power, gray power, white power, flower power. Right? Well, I used to say, if you have a belly button, you're in my church. So you're all in the Sacred Heart tribe, and you're all in the Scar Clan. And when you're a Scar Clan, you have to use the buffetings of your life as wisdom. Because when you get to be an older age, and this doesn't mean you have to be 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, right now, wherever you are, just remember, elders and white hair does not an elder make. This is the second adventure of life. It's another ritual initiation. Elders don't line up to get medicine. Elders dispense medicine in the form of wisdom. And that is the story of your life. That's the most authentic truth you have. So, <clears throat> your eccentricity. First thing I would tell you about aging. Your eccentricity is one of the most beautiful things about you. If you study with me, I will teach you what I call the psychology of the odd. It's a sign of giftedness. It's the square peg that will never fit in the round hole, never did, never will. But you need to recognize that's a blessing in your life. Otherwise, you'll end up obedient, obsequious, people-pleasing, and ordinary. And nobody comes here to live an ordinary life. If you'd be in StoryCorps, on New York City, you know, that mobile thing that you know, pulls people, random people off the street. And let me hear the story. It's like being interviewed by Studs Terkel. It's frickin' amazing what the average so-called ordinary person had to go through to get to that particular situation in life. Everybody, everybody is gifted, except so many people never got blessed for it, so they're never able to really rev, rev their own affections behind that. So recognize you're unique, unrepeatable, one of a kind. You're the first, you're the last, you're the best of your kind. And you have a gift to upload your whole life experience into the hard drive of the planet. So that's called spiritual audacity. Any Spanish speaking people here? Relampago! I just gave her the spiritual lightning bolt. <laughs> so in el elders inoculate the young. Our job is to initiate those coming after us. Not only just with yoga, but with our lifestyle and teaching them freedom. Freedom to play. And if they can't play, it's because they're hurt. So then you have to hold space for why are you so hurt? How can I help you through this? How can I get you to come out a little bit? Because really, most people do want to jo be joyful, right? Most people do want to be happy, but either they lost their way or they look so far outside of themselves and they only just see the world falling apart. They don't know how to see the world to cultivate the right kind of attention. Sift through. Don't be like a, a trauma porn troller. That you just listen to news that brings you down, especially right before you go to sleep. So if you want to learn, and remember, the young inoculate the old just like the old inoculate the young. I need the younger generations. You're giving me life by being here. Okay? Yeah, you. So, don't be afraid that by being too earthy, you'll get buried by suffering. By being too watery, you'll get flooded by suffering. By being too airy, you'll get swept away by suffering. By being too fiery, you'll get burnt by suffering. By being too spacious, you'll be lost in the vastness, in the suffering of it all. Elders confront all the elements and make use of them in your life. So this is metaphor. How do you change earth, air, fire, water, and space into the daily life lessons in everything you do? Being alive is heavy. I'm not trying to make light of it, even though I like to think of myself not as a dour personality. Doesn't mean I don't have suffering like everybody else. 
Not only my personal suffering, the personal suffering of every person in my life. I see through my daughters, my wife, my brother, his wife, my in-laws. None of them are free, right? But I, I don't try to turn them into Buddhists. All life is suffering. All life has a component of suffering. I remember the old hippie dictum. My mother hates me when I talk about the Buddha, but she loves me when I am the Buddha. So all that means is show compassion. Just be kind. They don't have to be your intellectual comrades. They don't have to be doing some yogic practice for you to honor the, the tough aspect of their life when they didn't have the resources or the teachers to help them lift them out of the dark. So you have to see human nature as it really is, not how you wish it would be. But again, it's not just negative and filled with malfeasance and stupidity, the, the, the madness of the morons of the mob, the intellectual ignoramuses that those of us who have education and believe we see through to another level, still, that doesn't make us better than them. We don't know why they're in the world. Maybe it's a negative example to other people or as a conflictual adversarial relationship for us to learn about. And you learn all about that on the mat. So again, you chose to come here, so I'm saying this to you. I don't go to anybody out on the street and try to give them unasked for advice, which is a form of abuse. I invite people to hit the mat. And once you hit the mat and you're doing yoga, now you've kind of given me license. All right, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to tell you the authentic truth as far as I see it. And it's going to challenge you. And the same challenges I've been talking about intellectually, you learn them all on the mat. And the way you do your mat work is the way you do your life. It's a mi microcosm of how you live your life. So. I want to talk about depression. One of the saddest things, gerontologically speaking, and again, I have been involved in what I would call the Grey Panthers. Everybody understand what I mean by the Grey Panthers? Anybody not know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. You raising your hand to help? No, you know, yeah. Right? The same idea of the Me Too generation. You think that just began now? I said, the zeitgeist of my time had unbelievable hope. The, oh, we recognized that as the march of time is going on, health is improving, financial situations are improving, better lives are improving, so that the lifestyle in terms of age is going to afford you the opportunity to probably live, will live well into your 70s and 80s or beyond. And not just doddering old people that need to be cared for, even though medicine keeps certain people alive way, way longer than we might think the quality of life deserves, being strapped to machines and so forth, unnecessary financial burden on the family. It's harsh, but you know, years ago, uh, our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have just left grandma and grandpa with some food, and then the tribe has to move on. So what do you do now? Well, we have to have a whole new sci uh, science of aging and a whole new sector of society that caters to older people. I understood this 50 years ago. I started working in hospice because my teacher said, you don't know anybody over 30. Will you like learn to relate to people older than you? Even though all the gurus, priests, shamans, sheikhs, anchorites, people who are studying, they were all older than me. That's one of my bio things, right? I was looking for the ritual elder my whole life, and I ended up turning into the ritual elder. So I started working with older people and looking at death in the face. Gerontology. There's still a biology of hope. My own teacher lived till 90. Maybe he's not a good example. But for me, he's representative of what can be done if you practice your whole life. And he was certainly intensive. I don't want to say fanatic because fanatic has like a negative connotation. But when you understand the word tapas in yoga, it's like going for the gold if you're an Olympian. Your whole life is passionately involved up with that and only that. Everything revolves around that. And of course, if you study the lives of anybody who's Olympians, although they have to do it themselves, they have a whole team to support them. Not just mom and dad. Maybe people underwriting from uh, the, the, uh, the clothesline or a nutritionist, or a psychologist, or a conditioning person. You have a support group to help you do your thing. So one of the things you learn about gerontology is people who don't understand this, they isolate themselves. 
They don't have community. And then they're stuck in themselves. There's plenty of time for me time, downtime, and figuring things, these, these things out. There's a lot of me search and research. So every time you look into this, you're really studying yourself. And then you eventually, the study of yourself is to learn how to forget yourself and get connected to something much wider than just yourself, because the great other demands something of each of us. So, the biology of hope, does this fit for you? If on most days you have lost the feeling of pleasure or pleasurable activities, if there's been a significant change in your weight, your appetite, a sleep disorder or insomnia, or excessive sleepiness during the day, feelings of agitation, restlessness, guilt, worthlessness, inability to concentrate, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. I'm happy to say that none of those are true except the last one for me. Because confronting end-of-life issues is on my face, on my plate, every day, and it has been since I've been 22. No morbid focus, just staring death in the face, not ready to jump into the abyss, a little too deep. As William Blake says, when first I held the cup of woe, it was too deep, I let it go. But then when it came around again, It seemed too deep for me to drain. But when at last I learned to sip, the cup was seldom from my lip. For grieving piecemeal, I have found traces of angels on the ground. So, suicide, I'm not willing to kill myself, harikiri, or anything like that. But death, every day I confront it. That's why those of you who watch my Dharma tributaries, with all sincerity, what do I say every morning? I'm glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too. And so for those of you who didn't flip the switch on yet, you woke up this morning, you didn't realize your soul was returned to you. You didn't have to do anything to make consciousness be psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. It's already working for you. Did you realize you're alive and you're aware? That wasn't enough to like give you a little, whew, great, thank you, one more day. Let me do it, thank you. Don't know how much time I have left. Wow, great. Meet the day with love. So, I try to make the most living my dying, but I've learned that with low neurotransmitters in my brain, I can't just say intellectually, I want to be up, I want to be positive, I want to give, I want to share, I want to be part of what's moving everything along. That's why in my school we used to give everybody a dose, right? That was my way of saying we could give you some dopamine, some oxytocin, some serotonin, some endorphins. And those are the basic neurotransmitters. They don't fire at the same time. So get rhythm and music and movement in your life. I don't care if it's yoga or not, just keep moving and you'll find the dopamine gets expressed. Oxytocin, you know, hug as many people as you can. Anybody remember Leo Buscaglia from the old days, Dr. Hug, right? Love is, love is a learned phenomenon. You know, you need a minimum of like seven hugs a day not to just go insane. How do you know if you're insane? Well, every day you're supposed to look in the mirror. Can you, can you flare a bicuspid? <laughs> now make your Elvis face. Thank you, thank you very much. You know that somebody, Elvis's grandma was Jewish? Did you hear about that? Thank you, thank you very much. Anyway, if you can do that, you're not insane. And then also, just do something crazy every day to, to keep you sane. Um, so the oxytocin is the feel-good chemicals. Hugging people, touching people, even if it means getting massage with the, with the mask on. Touch is important, the skin is so important for those who are taking notes. Touching by Ashley Montague. I did one of my, my thesis chapters on that. The importance of human beings touching. From the moment you came out of the womb, what was the first thing that you did to find that the world was reliable and available and safe? You got mom right there gazing at you with the love and pouring the milk of human kindness into you while you're bonding together. Come on, don't you get it? So deep. Unless it was a negative take and then you have to go into avoidance psychology or anxiety psychology. 
right? Or what they call attachment avoidance. Nobody was there for me. I'm never going to let myself experience dependence on anybody else again. Or anxiety um, attachment, where I'll do anything to prevent anybody from going out of my life, even if I have to be in an abusive relationship. So there's a positive aspect to attachment if it happened to you. But if not, just get touched touch and touch other people. Then serotonin is you have to learn how to relax. All of yoga is basically taking a chill pill. Everything about yoga is teaching you how not to react, how not to give your attention to what's wrong, which is always available. It's not like I don't see that when I'm talking positively. Don't be so naive. But you have to selectively sift. What do you, sift, what do you want to do with your attention? Because your attention is a magic wand. Right? Whatever you put it on, it grows and blossoms. Whatever you take it away from, it withers and dies. That's why I invite everybody, shameless marketing, shameless marketing, never forget, go to my website, gabrielhalpern.com, my, my affirmation archive. Right? I used to think in the old days when I was still trying to make money to help my girls go through college, right? I'm going to put a calendar, one of those tearaway calendars. Why should Hazelden have the calendar for all the al alcoholics? I'll have one for the yogic people. Every day you'll tear a thing and I'll have one of my affirmations with the quotes from one of the gurus. I couldn't finish the 365 <laughs> before the girls graduated college. So, that went so now I'm just giving it away. I don't need to monetize everything. I'm like, just giving it away and it's alphabetized A to Z, pick out. I don't want you to remember my affirmations like Shakespeare sonnets, although some of them are pretty good. What I really want you to do is to understand two or three words strung together that kind of, oh, that was a nifty way of saying it. Take that out and write your own affirmations. Write the things that tweak your subconscious mind because there's this relationship between your conscious thought like a seed and your subconscious mind like the soil. And it's going to produce after kind. So if you put in a negative seed or a smelly seed, you get a weed and pain and suffering in your stinking thinking. But if you put a different kind of thought in, it's going to produce a, a, a vegetable or a fruit that's sweet tasting to you. And you're going to have auspicious circumstances in your life reflecting back to you what we'd call good karma. And if you do that enough, you get a good karma snowball going in your life. And then if you do that, you'll have what I call a rampage of appreciation. Your whole life will be, I see good everywhere. I see the sparkle in everybody. Right behind the eyes, no matter what you think, I see it. I, I got the form. I got the realization. The angel came to me, told me, what do you want? I want to see the one in everyone. I got it. Not that I know the deepest state of samadhi. I would never say that. I don't understand when the books go to there. I haven't experienced that. But if you've asked me, have you experienced your own humanity? Yes. And so I can understand anybody else's humanity because transubjectively, it's the same. Take a step, no matter how small. No matter how small, take a step. Orphans, so the serotonin is live chill. Right, so move, rhythm, get the dopamine, oxytocin, hug, feel, kiss, love people, touch, really important. And then chill. Every part of your day should have something that relaxes you. If you're having sleep disorder, take a nap in the afternoon. Put on white noise. Get one of those electronic things where when you hear the sound, it moves in your nervous system, and all of a sudden you shift out of the beta and alpha state into the delta or the theta state. And now electronically, wow, science has helped you to move your nervous system, and the brain transmitters are giving you the good feeling. And then the endorphins is hmm, the feel-good chemicals that come from challenging yourself working the edge of whatever your practice is. And of course, right now, literally I'm talking about yoga, but it doesn't matter. Get on your Peloton bike, right? Or my friend does like a half hour of laps continuously in the pool, or, you know, or runs 10 miles. <laughs> Unbelievable what we can do. And the endorphins will go, and you'll feel exhilarated because you got that inside. But you have to understand what's, what they call said, said, S-A-I-D specific adaptation to imposed demand. It's a fitness frame. Ask your muscles to do something, and they'll step up to it. But do it consistently, and push the edge just a little. Not so much that you hurt yourself, but just enough to realize, wow, I got that in me. And that's where the teacher is. Because the teacher is supposed to help you both draw boundaries. Hey, too aggressive, you're going too far, back off. You're not ready for that. And then they're also the encourager. No, 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 you're really good, come on, do it, do it. And then after a while, they'll say jump, and they'll say how high, because they realize you're a trusty guide. They know that you're not interested in you hurting them, 
You have no ulterior motive except to draw forth within them true education. What are you interested in? So, just remember these things. It's almost four o'clock. I'm going to stop in a moment and open it up for questions. So look for your own abnormalities. Look for the stuff in you that normally you'd want to escape from or not admit to anybody else. Okay? I know how to be a good public relations person and give the spin. I could, I could talk about my suffering and you'd come away feeling good about it. So that's the least trustworthy part of, of my persona. Uh, but I say I use my men's circle. It's not like I don't share my complaints. I have the proper place to dump to sit in front of warrior brothers and tell them what's really going on at a deep, ugly level so the ghosts of my past don't have to barf all over my present life. And then, thanks, Quinn, <laughs> and then I can live fulfilled. <laughs> now, it's not like they don't nip at my heels, but I know how not to put my attention into that. I have gremlins in my mind like everybody else. They attack me on an ongoing basis. So I have two ways of dealing with it. Either the rockhead from Brooklyn says, fuck you, get out of my head. Or the Milarepa meditator sees when the demons come in my cave and I say, hey, this is my space, get out. And they don't leave. So then, you know, I'm a student of the Dalai Lama, let me be kind. Won't you please leave? You know, it's really nice, not nice of you to take over my space, not even asking me stuff like that. I didn't invite you here. So will you get out? They don't leave. Or maybe if I tell them a joke, one of my bad dad jokes, that, that'll be enough. Oh, def definitely, I don't want to hear another one from this guy. Why isn't a nose 12 inches? Because then it would be a foot. So, you know, there's things that, no, they didn't leave. So I said, maybe if I preach the Dharma to them. You know, I have the ability to share with you the enlightened vision of the Buddha, the awakened one. Let me give you some of his insights because the Dharma doesn't suffer in comparison to any teaching, and once you hear this, you'll be able to discourse with everybody. They didn't leave. Well, it pissed me off so much, what could I do? I said, oh, fine, well, this is my space. You don't have to leave, but I'm not leaving either. And of course, once I do that, they kind of like, you know, they're not getting my goat anymore. So I know how to deal with the gremlins, but I don't pretend that they're not there, and they still attack with virulent force, but I'm up to the task. So, notice hormonal changes that are going on in you at, at any level. Make sure you don't have lack of light exposure. All right? And if you're not outside enough every day, even when the weather's cold, even if you're not into Wim Hof breathing, you know, to learn to be like, you know, who's the guy? When, she said he went up Everest with nothing, nothing on, really? Okay. Um, at least take vitamin D3, or something else that gives you some sun exposure. Um, probably... The most important thing is unrealistic expectations fueled by Madison Avenue media, creating impossible standards of beauty. Thinking that somehow liposuction or Botox or any kind of operation is going to hide your own rejection of the aging process and the positive aspect like aged wine or aged cheese something that improves with time. Because if you have unrealistic expectations, then you're always falling short, and that will lead back into what I call the worthlessness feelings before. To come here a whole life and still not feeling like you made an impact on anybody, it's not too late, time's not, not over yet. But then you won't have the attitude of gratitude. To be thankful for everything that's happened in your life, and if you don't think this is possible, I don't do this only because I'm from the Jewish tradition. I'm trying to understand the beauty and the shadow of my own cultural background, which is also an ethnic background, and it's very diverse because, as you know, there, you can be Jewish, Polish, Jewish, Italian, Jewish, Chinese, Jewish, English. There isn't just one cult country that you come from. It's a culture, and then you can have a different ethnicity. Look back at your whole life, and when I read this, the survivors of Auschwitz, the survivors of the Holocaust, and people who have every right to just say, God doesn't exist, and human beings are so messed up, 
I'm just going, I'm like zombie sleepwalking through life. I have no belief. I'm like dead. Everybody in my family was killed in front of me or burned, cremated. Life just sucks. I don't even know why I'm alive. But as my rabbis <coughs> taught me, kindle children, gedenk, they remember. You know how many good deeds you can do in Auschwitz at night when people are dying just to hold their hand and listen to their stories? And I know you might want to kill yourself one day, just walk out into the water till it's up to the nose and just say, I can't take it anymore. And then you'll hear the voice of your teacher. Gedenkte, remember, you know how many favors you can do for people while you're alive, wherever you are? And then, all right, I'm in. What can I do to help anybody else? So the attitude of gratitude. Look back at the whole timeline of your life and see what can you redeem how did that piece of the puzzle fit into what has made you who you are right now? And then pick it up from now and raise it to the next level. Yoga just becomes a generic term for anything you do to yoke the powers of your mind, body, emotions, and spirituality together and use it in the service of the rest of humanity. I could go on.